The last part of module 12 covers Homo erectus. Um, Homo erectus actually is one of the most fascinating species we have in the genus Homo because it highlights a number of innovations biologically and culturally that we can see are most like us. You can see with Homo habilis and rudolfensis, it's, it's not quite us in, completely anatomically in form. You get that with Homo erectus or, or Gaster, and I'll explain the difference between the two as we as we go along. Homo erectus was found by a naturalist similar to Charles Darwin, but his name was Eugene Dubois, and he sailed in and around Southeast Asia, recording all sorts of observations of wildlife and geography and geology, and he came upon a number of different caves along. A, a river in Java in Indonesia along the, the Solo River. And what he came upon was a skull cap here, it's pictured, and a, and a femur, one of the long bones. He named it Pithecanthropus erectus. Uh, pith meaning ape, anthropos meaning human, erectus meaning upright. Later we adopted it into the genus Homo in terms of scientific and biological classification and, and termed it now just Homo erectus. You can find them at Zugudian in China. You can find them also in, in parts of Southeast Asia and they date to their oldest, probably about 1.8 million years. And the youngest ones around about 250,000. What do we notice in some of the material that we find in parts of Asia that is attributed to Homo erectus? That they have a cranial capacity of 800 to 1,000, right? Remember? Anatomically modern humans, or you, you're looking at a 1350 cc brain, but Homo erectus, 800 to 1000, it's more than Rudolfensis. Uh, they have a long, low skull, they have a big brow ridge, and they typically have small teeth. You can see the teeth getting smaller and kind of even tucking underneath the face. Enter in another creature known as Homo ergaster. Now, you don't need to know this difference, but when people use the term Homo ergaster, they're talking about the Homo erectus-like material that's found only in Africa and maybe some in Eastern Europe. It depends on who you talk to. Um, and if you use Homo erectus in a strict sense, you'd be talking about uh, ones outside of Africa. Uh, I'll just put ergaster slash erectus on these, but it also, uh, in this way, dividing them up kind of shows you history of scholarship. Um, because the leakies actually found uh, this material that's attributed to Ergaster erectus in the Cuvifora around the 1960s, around the same time they make discoveries uh, of Homo habilis at the Old of I Gorge. You can find this material even in parts of Eastern Europe, right? So that means Homo ergaster, Homo erectus fossils can be found in Africa, can be found in Europe, and they can be found in Asia. Here's the neat thing. This is the first hominid that has ever left Africa, right? Um, all the other ones are found in Africa, all the earliest ones. It's not until you get to Homo erectus, even at about 1.9, uh, 1.8 years, you have a major, uh, you know, major transition in the body form where the legs get longer than the arms proportionally, which, right, remember, arms longer than legs is an ancestral trait with, that is with the apes. Now you retain the ape-like arms, but then it's not until Homo erectus that we have longer legs and arms, a modern body proportion. And once that happens, Homo erectus or gaster begins to leave the African continent and explore other parts of the known world. Let's compare some of the Homo erectus uh, material to Homo gaster. Well, there's not that much of a difference. One of the biggest differences, some of the material in Africa typically has just a little smaller cranial capacity, but you can see that most of the morphology is identical. One of the most interesting and provocative specimens of Homo ergaster erectus is what's known as the Turkana boy or strapping youth. This is a, a creature that must have died very close to water and deposited immediately because look, we have almost all of this individual's skeleton and you can see that the legs are longer uh, proportioning to the legs. So that means they've lost all their climbing adaptations. 
And that means that they had to be sleeping on the ground and they weren't growing up in the trees when they were young, like we see with, you know, some of the apes. And we probably did see living in trees with Australopithecus and Paranthropus and even uh, even Habilis and Rudolphensis because they retain some of the climbing adaptation. That, that means they, they either grew up in the trees, spent a lot more time in the trees and just came into the ground occasionally um, um, or it was only exclusive to childhood. They still retained some of that ability and spent more time in the ground when they were older and maybe slept in trees. Because the only way you can sleep on the ground uh, with all these other animals that can eat you is if you have fire. And so we think that maybe uh, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster had to have fire in this way. When you look at the Turconoboy, the Turcona specimen, they have a much larger body size compared to Rudolphensis and Habilis. Much, much larger. They have the modern human limb proportions and a modern pelvis, a very robust bone suggesting they traveled some fairly long distances. Matter of fact, they have stronger bones than even we do today. The big question is, why did Homo erectus or Gaster leave Africa? Why are they the first hominid to explore other continents? Is it because they have better technology? Is it because once they had those anatomical changes, they could move faster and travel longer distances and they decided to explore more and leave, uh, leave Africa? Uh, did they have other changes in the way they were able to get food? Well, we, we do think they were able to cooperatively hunt, of course, but let's look at the tool they were able to make. When you look at the body form of Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, they have a body form anatomically like us. Does it also mean that they were able to hunt cooperatively and persistent hunt and be able to run animals into exhaustion so they could get really close to them? Well, with this tool, you could see them doing it. Not with older one tools like small little stone flake. You can't see early Homo habilis, Rudolphensis, cooperatively hunt and the the, the record of, you know, the cut mark bone suggests that scavenging was the earliest uh, means to getting animal uh, meat, animal products. Well, this tool is probably another good uh, reason why they were cooperative hunters, because this is a, a stone tool that you make out of the core. Uh, instead of just, you know, f trying to get sharp flakes off the core, using the hammer stone, you actually carve with the hammer stone uh, a tool out of the core and it looks like a, a kind of a hand axe, a composite tool. So the base can be used for cracking. Uh, there's a, it's bifacial, meaning it's sharp on both edges. It can be used for piercing at the end. It can be used for slicing and cutting from the sides, right? This is the dawn of core based stone tool technology. We probably had some changes in subsistence that once you get to Homo erectus, they are able to cooperatively hunt and not necessarily rely on scavenging. And they probably relied more on animal protein because you have a much larger brain and a much bigger body. And um, of course, we also think they had fire. And once you cook things, you actually reduce the cost of digestion. And then you actually see um, expansion of other parts of an organism, and this probably led to the expansion that we have in our brain.